In many ways, tonight's event for me brings a strong sense of deja vu. CIS started in the wake of the Whitlam years, where, in recent history, government had its first big growth spurt. The start of that period was around 24% of GDP. Now it's 50%. Maybe I've been wasting my time all these years, but I don't think so. The tidal flow of government is overwhelming. Yes, there have been positive reforms, and we are a much richer and in some ways freer place, though there are worrying signs on that front, which I think we know about. We certainly had something to do with that successful reform period. However, there seems to be a fault in the way modern democracies function, with what I would call a political market being rigged to one side, namely the supply side. Things could have been far worse, as the current European situation shows. I'm sure we have played a role in fending off that fate as well. But the signs are not good right now, particularly with this lengthy election campaign, which is not a campaign, threatening to splash cash in all directions. Target 30 is about bringing to the problem the skills and ideas that we have developed over a long period to start to turn things around. It won't be easy. As our friend and Benithan lecturer of a few years ago, P.J. O'Rourke said, the mystery about government is not how it works, but how to make it stop. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a mystery we intend to solve, at least give it a shot anyway, and we need your help, and there'll be more about that later. Tonight we have three speakers. David Murray was chairman of the Australian Government Future Fund Board of Guardians, serving between 2006 and 2012, and chair of the International Forum of Sovereign Wealth Funds. Prior to his appointment to the Future Fund, he was the Chief Executive Officer of the Commonwealth Bank of Australia between 92 and 2005, which I don't think anybody really <laughs> is reminding of. Uh, and he, and he, and he uh, presided over such a great period of growth for that organisation. Morris Newman, until March 2012, was the Chairman of the ABC, as well as former Chair of the Board of the Australian Stock Exchange. He was Chancellor of Macquarie University until 2008. And what's interesting, from this, point of, uh, from this organisation's point of view, he was on the founding board of the centre and our second chairman, serving for nine years uh, following Neville Kennard. Simon Cowan is the lead author of the Target 30 launch document, which you all have. He's a research fellow in the economics program and, amongst other things, will be working on government industry policy and regulation. Prior to joining CIS, he practised corporate law at a top-tier law firm in Sydney and London and, after that, joined the New South Wales government in their industry division. David will speak first to be followed by Simon and then we're going to have the questions and answers and then Morris will then give concluding remarks in his usual, usual forthright way and the Centre's Chairman Michael Darling will thank the speakers on behalf of us all. Quite a nice round of drinks and canapes, repeating what we've already had I guess, thanks to Macquarie will follow. Um, we've had a lot of very supportive messages, uh, emails and the like since we first announced what we were doing. 3.30 this afternoon, I received this one, and I'll read it to you. <clears throat> Greg, I noticed in the AFR that the CIS has launched a campaign to get government spending from 35 to 30% of GDP. We're, exactly, we're on exactly that track with government expenses peaking in 2010 at 35% of GDP and on track to hit 30% by 2016, including absorbing the effects of our recession and the Christchurch earthquake. I am telling some Aussie business audiences about this next week. We are halfway there, and I'm increasingly confident about reaching 30, even the, with an election next year. And this is important. Public consensus, consensus is sufficiently strong to prevent the major parties starting a bidding war, so it can be done. Regards, Bill English, Minister of Finance, New Zealand. Uh, and here's another one uh, going from uh, Wellington right the way to Perth, or with Canberra in the middle, I guess from Senator De Dean Smith, a uh, Liberal Party Senator from Western Australia. He wrote, I am adding my voice to this very worthy and urgent policy objective. I do not believe it is well understood enough across our community that excessive government spending crowds out innovation, personal responsibility and liberty in our country. Your campaign will be an important first step in holding future governments to account on this critical policy issue. I wholeheartedly agree with your comments that smaller governments can uh, increase economic growth and strengthen social and family bonds. And before I finish, I'll give you some more PJ O'Rourke. Feeling good about government is like looking on the bright side of any catastrophe. <laughs> when you quit looking on the bright side, the catastrophe is still there. Uh, please welcome David Murray. <laughs> well, thank you, Greg, and sincere thanks for the opportunity to support this timely initiative by the CIS. 
I want you to recall the large red sign at the wrong entrance to the motorway. It says, go back wrong way. This describes the Australian economy and its public finances today. Having been through the early stages of the global financial crisis and watching the policy errors of those that created it, <coughs> Australia has a chance of a lifetime to redirect its policy before it's too late. Turning things round will, however, require a degree of transparency and honesty of debate that we do not see today. In time, this will call for a clearer understanding of the Australian culture and why it is able to drift in what Professor Garno has called the great complacency, a culture in which the Australian people do not hold their, elect their electoral representatives to account and the representatives are not prepared to be held to account. The good news is that things can be turned around if we have these things. A shared understanding of what has actually happened in the world. Secondly, the truth about the Australian economy and its finances. And lastly, the general shape of a solution. Let me address these and start with what has happened in the world and where we are now in the unfolding of the global financial crisis. I say unfolding because it is by no means over. Um, you, you'll note that at the start of the crisis, uh, everything was attributable to banks. The issue was that if governments run loose fiscal and monetary policy for an extended time, the clear beneficiary as businesses in the totality of the system is banks. Uh, their business grows at an unprecedented rate. Asset prices grow no matter what. Any deal can be done, any commission earned. The fact is that if the government litters the pavement with dollar bills, some people will pick them up. And they did. And of course, there were some questionable practices in what happened. But that does not change the fact. Make no mistake, the crisis was caused by loose fiscal and monetary policy over an extended period in the world's two largest economies, the United States and the European Union. The excessive financial leverage and asset price distortions caused by this policy created a crisis of proportions not seen since the 1930s, requiring an immensely long process of painful resolution, a process which has hardly began, begun, if at all. At this point, over five years in, both Europe and the United States have higher government debt than in 2006, approaching $17 trillion in the United States alone. Both economies are in political deadlock over the degree of fiscal austerity necessary to work towards a longer-term sustainable solution. In fact, the process of offering debt-funded entitlements to attract votes does not appear to have been challenged very seriously at all. The consequence of political inaction has been to leave the response to central banks to stimulate growth with aggressive and unconventional monetary policy. This in turn has led to a currency war recently enjoined by Japan. It's hard to predict the outcome of a currency race to the bottom. I mean, one should it's easy in, in, in theory, that is the worst, worst managed economy should hit the bottom first. But this is about stimulating short term growth whilst avoiding the hard fiscal decisions needed for <coughs> sustainable longer term growth. So let me turn to the truth about Australia's position. I learned in relation to competition and business strategy that a firm should never get itself into position whether it is neither able to attack in a competitive sense nor defend itself. And that's where Australia is headed. Australia's cost structure is simply too high, largely driven by high wages at a time when productivity improvement is weak. Although unemployment appears low, wages are growing at close to 4% per annum, but total hours, well, unemployment is low, wages are growing at close to 4% per annum, but total hours worked in the economy are falling. The growth rate of hours worked is falling. So labour productivity is actually falling. 
Since labour generally accounts for most business costs, generally we, we say two thirds, the outlook for employment is also weakening. The European-esque process of continuously increasing regulation reduces productivity by adding steps to work processes rather than taking steps out. We know if you target productivity in business, you redesign work to remove steps from work processes. At the same time, both the budget and current account are in structural deficit, meaning that the deficits cannot be removed without a structural change in the economy and the serious policy changes needed to affect it. In the case of the budget, um, as the CIS has pointed out, the Commonwealth outlays which are the most challenging to address for politicians, namely welfare, education and health, increased from 20% of outlays in 71 to 58% in 2011. Welfare spending is $132 billion. Without some tough decisions, these expenditures will remain a rising fixed cost, detached from the fortunes of the economy, which is subject to changes in commodity prices, world growth patterns and other exogenous factors. Hence, we already have an operating leverage problem in the budget. We know in business that an operating leverage problem, go down to the bank and talk about it, and they will tell you, if you have that, you can have less debt. So, after 21 years of continuous growth and the best terms of trade in 150 years, Australia has both structural budget and current account deficits. Not a good result. Dependency on foreign capital is the main driver of the current account deficit, but even so, the trade balance has rarely been positive, notwithstanding the terms of trade boom. In short, Australia must refinance its net payments of dividends and interest to foreigners each year. This amounts to some 40 billion per annum and results from Australia's high level <coughs> of net foreign liabilities, some 57% of GDP, a number which is not to be repeated in Canberra. The combination of structural deficits, high operating leverage and high net foreign liabilities means Australia cannot match the level, even the prudent level, of government debt of some other nations. Both the UK and the USA, by contrast, have high net, pro, sorry, high net foreign assets in the private sector, offsetting government debt, and even though that, that government debt is excessively high. But Australia does not have private sector net foreign assets. Going into the crisis, Australia's critical asset was the absence of Commonwealth debt and its AAA rating. I recall at the time discussing in Canberra the need for the government to get around the world and sell that position as hard as possible because of the funding pressure on the banks from outside Australia. Why did I do that? Because I read Boris Shedvin's book about Australia in the Great Depression and how Australia went within £10 million of outright default in 1932 and the work that the government and its officials of the day had to do to scratch around the world and reassure people that Australia would always repay its debts. But gross debt is now approaching $300 billion, or about 18% of GDP, on the top of net private sector liabilities. Note that the net debt of 9% of GDP is not the relevant number because bondholders do not have a right of set-off against other government assets. In the event that bondholders want to redeem their bonds, and they must wait to do so, they know that a government can pledge or run down its assets, hence a structural deficit raises their level of risk. Now, the majority of this debt, about 80%, is held by foreigners. Bear in mind that the 200 plus percent of GDP, GDP debt of the Japanese government is not held by any foreigners. But in Australia's case, 80% of the debt is held by foreigners. That means that our spending decisions, including our political promises, are increasingly in the hands of others and the rating agencies. 
yet the AAA rating is looking increasingly vulnerable and any downgrade would flow onto the states, the banks and corporations generally, putting further pressure on financing the current account deficit and the budget through rising interest rates. What is not discussed is the vulnerability of very high foreign liabilities and the weakness in the rating, <coughs> namely the relationship between external debt and current account receipts. This is how the rating agencies look at it. Australia falls well outside the scores of the median AAA rated, median of the AAA rated countries. For example, the rating agency's measure of external debt as a percentage of current account receipts uh, is about 100% for the medium, tri median AAA rated country, but over 200% for Australia and the median G7 country which has got some pretty awful players in it. Ultimately, with a structural current account deficit, the Australian dollar will not be a classical safe haven currency. With recent confirmation that the budget will remain in deficit, some suggestions that foreign buying of CGS has slowed and a marked slowdown in mining investment, it is time to reassess policy. In thinking about a solution, my third point, the solution, uh, it's helpful to reflect on government spending trends. In general, governments have increased spending on things that are nice, but has decreased spending on things that are valuable. Put another way, they have increased consumption-related expenditures and decreased investment-related spending. Now, what, why is this important? Contrary to some of the derogatory remarks made about politics earlier, I'm a great believer that we operate in one system, a system that has people and government and a private sector and a public sector. It's how we get those working in harmony that matters. So the solution lies in both reducing overall government spending but increasing the proportion of investment-related spending. As the CIS program will show, consumption-related expenditure eventually becomes a drag on the economy. But there are areas in which government is better... Oh, we're at Macquarie, I shouldn't say this. The government is better placed to invest than the private sector. Normally in infrastructure, where there are positive spillover effects and externalities arising from the public sector's capacity to pool risks. Uh, in a book written by the Harvard Business School about the future of capitalism, in the conclusion, they, uh, th they concluded that the problem with governments is they've abandoned th their traditional role in a capitalist system. To achieve the overall outcome and the right balance requires government to confront productivity improvement in the economy generally and in its own activities. This has been done elsewhere <coughs> To, by facing up to a far more efficient conduct of health, education and other services in ways we have not been willing to accept. Much is made of the Scandinavian countries and the things that they've done. But the things that they've done have been achieved against the background that they were in horrible difficulty in the first place. <coughs> difficulty... I suppose, characterised by a marginal tax rate on business of 100%. And to get out of that problem, uh, where they still believe in a higher level of government spending, they have subjected every area of government expenditure to contestability. School voucher systems, hospitals run by the best people at running hospitals, you name it, they have made everything contestable. At the same time, to the extent that they spend their money on public goods, Thomas the Tank Engine, all the usual stuff, uh, they make sure that people realise that it works efficiently so they get some acceptance for what they're doing. But it is not possible um, for, for us to say what they've done is necessarily correct because their starting position was so weak. In respect to infrastructure, there must be publicly transparent processes 
for project ranking and selection based on standards for cost-benefit analysis and publication of the results. No different to the accounting standards we all live with. This would not be unique. Just recently, Norway published its uh, review done last year, its, its review done by a judge, of uh, its public assumptions for cost-benefit analysis uh, which must be used in all project analysis. And they published uh, a critique of whether any of those should change or not. So this approach, together with trading, the trading of wage rises for tangible productivity improvement and reduction of the regulatory bur burden would bring things around more quickly than most appreciate. It does, however, call for a dose of reality. Recent suggestions that we could use our AAA rating and the historical low cost of debt in the world today to finance large investment in infrastructure would, without offsetting adjustments, be a cargo cult experiment with the potential to leave us even more exposed. My view about this is not only that we operate in one system, uh, private and public sector, but the significant issue is, is the people or the human system that we operate, not necessarily the technical system. And that means that um, we need a general wake-up call that our situation is not what we think it is, but that needs to be part of a cultural shift in which we reject spin, stop copying Europe, fight for transparency, hold our politicians accountable and elect only those who want to be accountable. We must discuss the risks to our democracy and rule of law that come from this complacency. It's pretty sad when a shadow attorney general can stand up and say that they are going to review all Commonwealth laws to remove the reversion of onus of proof in any area where it occurs in the law. That is pretty sad. Well, we're lucky because we can turn this around, but remember the sign on the motorway. It calls for early and decisive posturing, and I've no doubt that the CIS project will make an extraordinarily valuable contribution. Thanks very much. <laughs>